Okay, very, very last thing, last video is just um, so if ventilation is the primary way that you control PCO2, how do you control ventilation? And uh, most of this is, is going to make sense. You just have to under big, pay attention to the words. So um, primarily the way that ventilation is controlled is via neural control. Um, the nervous system controls your breathing rate. Um, the action potentials originate in the medulla oblongata and the pons. That's where most of your breathing is controlled. But your cerebral cortex can override to some degree because, of course, this is the somatic nervous system, not the autonomic nervous system because you're controlling skeletal muscle contraction. Um, it can override it until you change your pH and then it'll piss off your brain or change your carbon dioxide concentration. So here's the general process. Um, um, the inspiratory neurons will go from the medulla oblongata and the pons. They will go via the somatic nervous system um, to the diaphragm, all the way back here, to stimulate the diaphragm. And by the way, it's the phrenic nerve. Um, and then the intercostal nerves to stimulate the external intercostal muscles. And then, of course, what they will do is they will cause contraction of the diaphragm, moves it down, contraction of the external intercostal muscles, increases the size of the thoracic cavity. All that good breathing stuff occurs. <coughs> um, this action potential to the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles is rhythmic, inherently like just sends out a rhythmic depolarization that will cause contraction. Um, the stimulus goes for a while and then it stops after about two seconds. And then what happens, of course, is because of the elastic nature of your lungs and also the relaxation of the muscle, um, thoracic cavity decreases in size, lungs snap back in healthy nut muscles, exhalation occurs. Now, Expiratory neurons, they don't fire all the time because, of course, expiration is mostly a passive recoil process, muscle relaxation, elastic recoil. They really only fire during high levels of ventilation, like when you're breathing a lot or when you decide to make them do it like <sighs> that is um, uh, um, forced expiration. So these only fire during high levels of ventilation or if you make them do it, and the impulse goes internal intercostal, in, intercostal nerves to internal intercostal muscles, which squishes your ribs together, forced expiration. Of course, you could also be doing stuff with your abdominal muscles as well. So um, inspiration goes out rhythmically, expiration goes out when necessary. So now let's talk about the inputs that can control, alter um, ventilation rates, okay? So what kinds of things can alter ventilation rates? Well, your cerebral cortex, because it's somatic nervous system, even though the, the pons and the medulla oblongata are doing their thing, um, somatic nervous system, the cerebral cortex, I can decide <gasps> to hold my breath, um, which is apnea. Um, I can decide to... <gasps> breathe really quickly if I want to, because my cerebral cortex could say so. But in addition, um, your higher brain centers um, uh, are, can like override what's going on. Um, your emotions can override what's going on. If you've ever been so upset that you like cried to the point that you could, like, could hardly breathe because you were, you know, just uh, hyperventilating, strong, strong emotions, pain can cause an increase in breathing. And then you're also monitoring the chemistry of your blood to figure out if you need to breathe more. And hopefully this will make good sense to you and won't be too painful. And that is um, a couple of different things. So um, what you are monitoring in your bloodstream is you're monitoring um, three things. The PCO2 of your blood, the carbon dioxide concentration in your blood, the pH of your blood, and the PO2 of your blood. Counterintuitively, it is not PO2 that is more likely to cause an increase in ventilation. It's actually PCO2. Okay, so the most powerful respiratory stimulant at rest is an increase in PCO2. And that is because carbon dioxide is really, really easily diffused into your cerebrospinal fluid and it'll piss off your brain. 
Um, you can't really stop it from diffusing into your cerebrospinal fluid. So I'm going to show you a picture. These are what we call the central chemoreceptors. They're primarily in the medulla oblongata. Here's what happens when your carbon dioxide starts to increase in your um, bloodstream. Carbon dioxide can and does diffuse straight into your cerebrospinal fluid, and then your cerebrospinal fluid does this equation, and then you end up with H+, and your brain really has crap for buffering systems. So you piss off your brain really, really quickly with an increase in carbon dioxide. No real buffers in the cerebrospinal fluid, so a pH decreases in the cerebrospinal fluid, and your medulla oblongata goes, screw this, you are breathing whether you want to or not. Okay, so that is why, because of what we call these central chemoreceptors, because they're in the central nervous system. Central chemoreceptors are activated by an increase in PCO2 in the blood. It'll make you breathe. Carbon dioxide diffuses in your brain. Your brain's like, we are not putting up with this crap. It makes you breathe. Now, the pH of the blood, look at this. H plus does not diffuse through the blood-brain barrier, right? It can't get in. So the blood um, H plus diffuses poorly, really, or not at all into the CSF and doesn't really affect these central chemoreceptors. So it's not as dramatic as you, have, you would expect, but it does affect the peripheral chemoreceptors that we've already met. So remember, remember, remember that we are monitoring carbon dioxide, um, pH, H+, plus, and oxygen in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch, okay? And when we were monitoring those before, we were monitoring those to figure out whether I needed to increase, you know, um, blood flow, blood pressure. But now I'm going to use the same input, right, to go, it's not showing on this picture, a different output. So if I detected at these locations um, low pH, what would happen is the signal would be sent to my medulla oblongata and my medulla oblongata would say, hey, breathe more, but not because it diffused into my cerebrospinal fluid, but because I detected it in the carotid signage in the aortic arch. So if you detect low pH in those, it will activate not central chemoreceptors because these are central chemoreceptors in the central nervous system. These are called peripheral chemoreceptors. It will activate those in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. Okay, and then the very last thing that actually has less of an effect on ventilation than you would imagine is the PO2 of blood. Um, so the PO2 of blood, interestingly, doesn't have a dramatic impact on ventilation until it gets super duper low, below about 60 millimeters of mercury. When it falls below 60 millimeters of mercury, it will activate these peripheral chemoreceptors. And it, these will go, I'm going to send impulse, I'm going to tell on you at the medulla oblongata because this PO2 is too damn low. Even if the PCO2 and the pH were just fine, it would go, this PO2 is too damn low. You guys need to breathe more. So it will trigger an increase in ventilation rate, but it will give you a lot more room to metaphorically hang yourself than you would imagine. Fiend. Done.